So in this video, I'm gonna finish discussing Mendel's experiments. We're gonna wrap up his understanding of how genetics works, and we're gonna to try to see how that applies to other organisms, and maybe in some cases where Mendel's rules really don't apply. So um, we can continue Mendel's studies by thinking about, I think I talked in the, in the previous video about different flower colors that he studied. Uh, we saw that when you cross purple and white pure breeds, that all of the offspring came out purple. Uh, but then when you self-pollinated these plants, they came out three-fourths purple, one-fourth white. And that, that that mathematical result was really important to him. He also studied that for other traits too. So maybe in some cases he studied uh, the seed shape, where maybe it comes out round or wrinkled. As it turns out, round was the dominant trait. And when he self-pollinated the plants, three-fourths came out round, one fourth came out wrinkled in that third generation. And so Mendel's final question was, what if we cross these plants um, with both of these traits at the same time? What if I started with parents that were both round and purple, the, the, the two dominant traits, and what if the other pure breed parent was uh, white and wrinkled? Um, certainly those would pass on, and he kind of knew that the initial offspring would be purple and round. That they would both show the dominant traits. But what he was really interested in is what happens if you self-pollinate that plant? Um, how does it sort of work when you, when you cross two genes at the same time? And he reasoned that there might be two possibilities here. One possibility is that maybe the dominant alleles that came from that doubly dominant parent have to stick together. And so maybe if you kind of think about these results um, together, maybe you just get the same three-fourths, one-fourth result you got from the, the single gene experiments. So maybe just purple and round would continue to stick together, white and wrinkled would continue to stick together, but you'd still get that three-fourths, one-fourth result. Another possibility was that the two genes were completely independent of each other. And you might really mix up what, you, what those uh, doubly heterozygous organisms might pass on. And, and a way to think about what results you might get here would be to think about multiplying independent pos probabilities. Maybe in math class you remember that if, if two probabilities are completely independent of each other, you multiply them together. And so to kind of think about the results that you would get if, if this were the case, I want to think about the good old FOIL method from math class, or maybe you uh, remember you multiply the first numbers uh, uh, first, so what's 3 fourths and 3 fourths? Maybe we, we would expect to see 9 sixteenths of the offspring to be both purple and round. Um, in the FOIL method, you multiply the outside next. So if you multiply these two, then you'd expect 3 sixteenths of the offspring to be purple and wrinkled. Um, I means inside, right? So uh, if you multiply these two, then 3 sixteenths of the offspring would be round, and, uh, white, excuse me, in flower color, and round in seed shape. And then um, if you multiply the last for FOIL, uh, maybe 1 16th of the offspring would be white and wrinkled. So maybe there are kind of two very different predictions, and as it turns out, when Mendel ran this experiment, this over here was supported, and he never got those results. And so because he got that famous uh, set of mathematical numbers, that pattern over and over and over again, which I don't need you to memorize, by the way, um, that's just a very complicated way of saying uh, for Mendel that um, genes are always independent of each other. If you cross two things at the same time, they will be independent of each other in their inheritance, something he calls the law of independent assortment. And as it turns out, maybe independent assortment is something we've talked about before. That's because when we later studied meiosis, the process of independent assortment helps to explain why two genes might be independent in inheritance from each other. So if the two genes are on different chromosome pairs, then the reason why they might split up an inheritance is because every time you line the chromosome pairs up to make gametes, you might line them up in different ways. Sometimes you might line them up to where dominants really do pass on together and recessives pass on together, but other times you might line them up so that they do not pass on together. 
And so really the, the process of independent assortment helps to explain why two genes are always independent of each other. Although I will say that that's only true if the two genes are on different chromosome pairs. If they're on the same chromosome pair, it gets more complicated and we would talk about that kind of in a more advanced course. So just to kind of finish, um, if all of these things are true, then Mendel's model of how genetics works is perfectly valid, not just for pea plants, but for any other species that sexually reproduces. So if there's just one gene causing the trait, two versions, one dominant over the other, and if you're thinking about two genes at the same time, as long as those two genes are on different chromosome pairs, then Mendel's rules apply and even for us humans. So just to give kind of a simple example, I talked about sickle cell anemia, I think in, a, in another video in the Genetics One unit, um, but everything about how sickle cell anemia works in humans follows Mendel's rules. Um, and if you have potentially two parents that are carriers or are heterozygous, um, so they don't show having sickle cell themselves, but they get tested and we find out that they're heterozygous, then we can give them a prediction, just like Mendel would have, that you have a one in four chance of potentially having a child that actually has the disorder and shows it. And that's you know just as true for, for pea plants it is, as it is for humans. But as um, biologists studied other organisms, they found some other patterns, other traits that didn't quite follow Mendel's rules because they didn't give the results that he would have predicted. And I just want to go through kind of two basic kinds of exceptions. Um, the reason why most human traits don't work in Mendel's fashion, and so why we're mostly talking about pea plant traits and fruit fly traits and any kind of uh, problems that we give you. Uh, most human traits are much more complicated in inheritance because many phenotypes that we show might be the result of many genes contributing to the phenotype we see. And so that's just a phenomenon we call polygenic traits or polygenic inheritance. Poly is just a root word meaning many. So if there are many genes um, that contribute to something that we see, um, one basic example would be human skin tone. Lots of people kind of have an intermediate um, uh, skin tone and, and fewer of us have extremely dark or extremely light skin tones. And that's kind of the hallmark of a, of a trait being polygenic. Um, there are lots of ways that you can, might inherit various alleles if, if there are multiple genes all playing a role um, that leads to kind of an intermediate skin tone. Another very important example of why Mendel's rules often don't apply um, is that there's kind of more complicated realities. Maybe for certain phenotypes, the environment plays a role in shaping phenotype. So just to go back to flower color and another species of flower called hydrangeas, the, um, the pH of the soil in which you grow these flowers will influence the color of the flower that we see. And so this is kind of an interesting case where a gardener actually transplanted this flower from one environment to another, and that's why it's starting to change the color that it shows. And so maybe for many human traits, it's not only the, the DNA you inherited from mom and dad, but it's also the environment in which you grow up in and which you live in that might ultimately influence some of the phenotypes you show. So just as kind of a quick summary, we, we kind of finished Mendel's rules um, and talked about how Mendel gave us a very powerful start for how genetics works, but how in later organisms and in later studies, we had to move on from Mendel's model and kind of revise it to better understand how um, organisms' traits work.